and a 10 production date. Did you know that the FNAF movie first started being discussed in 2015? Yeah, well, um, it's it's seven years later. After that, the movie aimed to release in 2020, and then in 2021, Scott said that filming would start in spring of this year. And now, in 2022, from the mouth of Jason Blum himself, or I guess technically from his, his fingers because it was on Twitter, we now know that the FNAF movie is supposed to be filming in February of 2023. As to whether that's actually going to happen is honestly questionable, since I mean this is yet another time that we've been told something is going to get filmed, but we won't know if it's it's true until February of next year, but at least it's something to look forward to for the end of winter, since for some reason, someone decided to put Christmas at the beginning of the coldest and most depressing time in the goddamn world, so maybe instead you can have this be something that we can all look forward to after the snow, at least if you're in this hemisphere. Cause like, once Christmas is over, alright, the snow has no point to be here, okay, and I want it gone, so I'll be using the FNAF filming as, as a way to cope, basically. It a nine script theme. Back in 2021, there was a whole Reddit post titled Bad News About the FNAF Movie, which plenty of Redditors also decided to report for breaking rule nine of the FNAF subreddit, uh, that rule being no misleading titles. And technically, they were right, since this was ultimately a joke post by Scott Cawthon, since the bad news was that they, they came up with a script, so they weren't making any more scripts. But again, it, it wasn't removed because, I mean, it, it's Scott. The scrapped scripts included things like the plushies take Manhattan, Silver Eyes, Pawn Shop, Cassidy, and Ghost Trackers, which is basically just the ghost facers from Supernatural but FNAF themed. Uh, but they all had their own issues. Some were too crammed, some had too low stakes, some were just plain old boring, and also apparently a, a lack of coherent story was listed as a problem for one of them, despite that being the whole selling point of the series. But eventually, they settled on a screenplay known as the Mike screenplay, which has the description as, quote, Hmm, this makes sense. Why didn't I think of this before? So, that's what we know. Uh, we, we know that it's probably themed around Mike, but that's it. Also, guys, if you're enjoying the video and want to see more like it, be sure you hit like, alright? It helps us out. The algorithm is, is a pain, so please hit like, juice the numbers. It inflates my ego exponentially, and I, I need it right now. Okay. In a date, original plan. In July of 2015, it was reported that Gil Kennan, the, uh, who's done The Poltergeist and Monster House, had made a deal with Warner Brothers to direct a Five Nights at Freddy's movie adaptation, since, you know, it was a year after the first release and it was immensely popular. In June of 2017, Kennan announced that his adaptation had been cancelled by Warner Brothers and that he was stepping down. And in early 2018, it was announced that Blumhouse Productions was set to make the movie with Chris Columbus, the, the one who worked on Harry Potter, Home Alone, and Mrs. Doubtfire, not the other one, as the director, and the project was aiming for a 2020 release date, but I mean at this point, like I said, it's 2022 and they haven't even started filming, so I think it's fairly safe to say that while we knew the original plan, that's gone out the window, and then it's it's been laying on the I-95 being run over for the better part of two years now, uh, and in this metaphor, the window was also next to the highway. And it's Seven Blumhouse. Like I just mentioned, the current company producing the movie, despite the original director having left, is Blumhouse Productions. Blumhouse is still producing, uh, even though Chris Columbus isn't directing. And honestly, that's probably a good idea in general for Blumhouse, since Blumhouse is known for making incredible productions on smaller budgets, Paranormal Activity being the best example of this. But also, with movies like Get Out, Split, The Purge, Insidious, and more under their belt, Blumhouse was honestly who should have had this movie from the beginning. Especially since I feel like this movie can give off a very, like, Saw vibe with the whole Springlock suits and all that jazz. Like, if the game scenario was made into a movie, instead of this being a separate entity, it would just, it would absolutely end up being a, a very Saw-like scenario. I can imagine, like, the phone guy saying things like, the crank to those Springlocks is inside you, and not in a metaphorical way, it's literally in your leg. And then there's, like, a time for like an hour before the sprinklers come on, which we all know is a bad idea with spring lock suits and stuff. I don't know. I think it would be funny. Uh, that, that would be fun. Someone should do that as a fan film. And in six, official casting. Uh, there was a lot of rumored casting for the FNAF movie a while back, alright? We even made a whole video about our favorite fan casts. However, about the official casting, alright? There is, there is none. There has been no officially announced casting despite what Google might say. Google, when it brings up a cast list, doesn't actually use the movie, alright? It uses as many 
sources as it can to find the casting list, as an attempt to make sure it's right. This includes articles from before any official casting was announced though. Meaning that currently, if you search up the FNAF movie cast, you're going to see it as if they have been cast, but this is all from articles, blog posts, and reddit posts, and even more talking about what the community wants to see. So despite the fact that Willem Dafoe would make an incredible William Afton in my eyes, uh, it, he hasn't actually been cast, I don't think, or at least officially announced. It's a culmination of the most popular actors that the fans want, at least currently on Google, which I mean maybe Blumhouse should look at before February, um, and also cast me in it, please, because that, that would be fun as hell, I want to do that. Halfway through into number 5, Wally's Wonderland. While it's technically not a FNAF movie thing, th this is the kind of thing that I had to include on this list. I mean, come on. This movie starring Nicolas Cage was most definitely meant to be a FNAF movie before the FNAF movie could come out. Quote, A quiet drifter is tricked into a janitorial job at the now condemned Willy's Wonderland. The mundane task suddenly becomes an all-out fight for survival against wave after wave of demonic animatronics. Fists fly, kicks land, titans clash, and only one side will make it out alive. This is basically just the plot to a FNAF fan game, but in a movie form, alright? I even thought that the movie was called Wally's World, which was either lo the location from a, a fan game, or it just goes to show how memorable this movie is in comparison to FNAF. So this would honestly be hilarious. Um, if like Wally's Wonderland characters or Willy's whatever it's called ends up actually like in a FNAF game or at some point or like mentioned in the FNAF movie. I don't know. That'd be funny. Hell, maybe this is like the movie that Scott's in FNAF universe counterpart ended up making because of the games he made in universe, you know? Like how Scott gets a FNAF movie in our world, maybe his game version did too. I don't know, I think that'd be hilarious if that's the case. And considering how FNAF is, is kind of leaking into our world, I don't know, it wouldn't be that far of a stretch. And a, and a cameo uh, or reference to like a clear store brand FNAF movie within the actual FNAF movie would be absolutely insane and I would I would love it I would pay money just to see that reference. And at four, theories. We also know that there are tons and tons of theories about the movie, enough to make up at least two lists on this channel. However, we can't really be sure of which ones are correct until the movie releases, but I guess that's kind of the point of theories. Uh, but let's go over some of the current ones, alright? There's a theory that Jack Black will at least make a cameo, considering the viral TikTok of the beloved actor singing the Living Tombstone song. I mean, like, the lyrics he sings are even Five Nights at Freddy's, that's where I wanna be. So. To, to not let him be in Five Nights at Freddy's would just be a sin in my eyes, alright? Theories about the rating of the movie are also up in the air, positing that it could be something closer to rated R, considering how now most fans of the series are above the age of 18. Like, even looking at our statistics on previous FNAF videos, only 10% of the total viewers were between 13 and 17, and the other 90% was 18 and up and the 10% could still be closer to 17 than 13, all right? However, if even Black Adam is gonna end up dropping its rating, I'm pretty sure that for the sake of the brand, the FNAF movie is probably gonna be PG-13 and maybe 14A at most, but most likely PG-13. And what I think is my personal favorite theory, the Scott Cawthon will reprise his role as the phone guy should the role be in the movie theory. I don't know, okay? We don't know much about the script that's being produced, um, but if it does have a phone guy, Hopefully it will most likely be Scott, okay? And hopefully we'll get like a brief shot of him on the phone to get the fans cheering in the theater because we'll all know that it's Scott. So, I don't know, that'd be fun. Getting close to the end in number three, Mike. Based on what we know, thanks to Scott's reddit post from last year, we know that the Mike screenplay, as Scott called it, is the script that they're actually using for the movie. Or at least, the one that they were going to be using for the movie as of 2021. It, it's been over a year since that post, so things <laughs> might have changed again, but based on what Scott was saying about it, it had all the right characters, all the right motivations, and all the right stakes. So, we can assume that Mike will be in the movie, considering how it's the Mike screenplay, and if he isn't, that's kind of an additional misleading script title there, Scott. You're breaking rule 9 even more. He also said in that post that filming would start in spring of 2022, and we all know how that went, so I don't know. Uh, if Mike is in the movie, we can also assume that the other Aftons will be present. Um, Elizabeth and Crying Child could have potential to be in there, unless the movie takes place post-1983 bite. Uh, but Big Daddy Afton is bound to make an appearance, given that he's the main antagonist of the series and also the, the 
father of Mike. Um, and I mean Big Daddy because he's the father of what, who is seemingly the main character, not in the other way. So please continue to refrain from sending me Springtrap themed content, please. Um, if you do, I will block you and report. And ultimately, in at number two, Emma Tanny. Jason Blum, while announcing that the movie would be filming in February of 2023, or allegedly at least, he also announced that Emma Tammy will be directing. Emma Tammy is seemingly a little known director, at least to me. I don't think she has anything major on her resume. Most notably, I could see Into the Dark, Fair Chase, The Wind, and the Left Right game under her belt. So, in my mind, this is certainly an interesting choice. But maybe someone that we don't know is who should be directing this movie. Since with someone like Chris Columbus and like Warner Brothers, they would just be worried about setting up another movie and making a successful franchise, whereas Emma will be okay with having a one-off under her belt as long as it does well, and if it does do well, it will look good having a second one on there too. Especially with such a popular franchise and such a famous studio behind her. So needless to say that while some of her work has been subject to criticism before, this is her chance to bring everything back into the positive, and personally I, I hope that she kills it. No pun intended. And finally, in at number one, real animatronics. Now, originally, when I saw production photos of the team working on the design for the animatronics, I genuinely thought that this movie was going to be stop motion, um, like Tim Burton style, basically. But after Jason Blumhouse announced that the Jim Henson Creature Shop is working on the animatronics, it all kind of clicked in my head. Because that's just kind of how the Jim Henson Creature Shop makes their props and whatnot. That's the process. And if you don't know, these guys are incredible. And they've worked on some insane movies, which also makes them an incredibly cool addition. They've worked on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Jungle Book, Where the Wild Things Are, Batman Begins, and The Muppets, not to mention Sesame Street, Jesse, and a whole lot more. And you know what? Since Debbie Ryan is Bay, I think that the Jesse thing is probably the biggest name drop on that list, alright? Ignore Hitchhikers, ignore Batman Begins, ignore Muppets, Jesse's where it's at. So, yeah, this is gonna be pretty damn sick. Um, so. Good job, guys. In a 10, Circus Baby. Let's start off with one of the deadliest animatronics in the game. Baby has an official death count of two, the first being Elizabeth, William's daughter, and the other being Henry, as we see in FNAF World. But it's not just the ability to kill that's crazy, it's the incredibly advanced technology inside the animatronic that's really impressive here. The ability to contain a whole child-grabbing claw, and then also a containment chamber for said kid is pretty damn impressive. But also the ability to use pins on on her body to change her appearance is also pretty insane. Not to mention all of her other features like ice cream dispensing and balloon inflating at her fingertips, but all of this is again overshadowed by the absolute carnage that Baby has the ability to cause. And honestly, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg, not even including the Fast Bear Frights version that can change her appearance into an actual person. Oh wait, no, I guess that's the normal novels. Whatever. It's weird. And scary. In a nine mini arenas. Why are the mini arenas so goddamn creepy? They're not scary per se, but they literally tear Ballora to pieces. So there's something there, at the very least. The mini arenas are basically the robotic versions of those kids in your neighborhood that are always screaming or causing trouble at literally all hours of the day. And then they go to a nearby school, so you're never really rid of them and you gotta deal with them constantly. Or they run down the street when you knock at the door to see their older brother. And then their family is so damn lazy that you you have to take off after him. So you end up chasing a toddler that's in nothing but a diaper down the street at 11 in the morning, catch him in front of your other friend's house, and then have the kid pulling at your hair and punching and kicking you all the way back to his house, and then people realize that you're not related. And then you don't even get a thank you for doing the parent's job. That's the moment I knew how Spider-Man felt when the police uh, didn't, don't thank him for fighting the dude with four robot arms so that they don't have to. But that's a totally fictitious scenario that would be too ridiculous to happen in real life. Look, I know his older brother watches these videos, okay? So yeah, Roshane was a piece of work. And it ain't Nightmare Animatronics. While not the epitome of horror, the Nightmare Animatronics are certainly not the nicest of fellows. Not only that, but they are, in fact, not real. They're an illusion, which makes them even more terrifying if you ask me. Or like, illusion is not really the proper word, because they're in a dream. Anyway, not only do these 
creations cause horrific visions to anyone who knows about them, but they also kill a coma patient. Crying Child, as we know, is in the hospital in FNAF 4, making this game entirely just a nightmare. However, getting caught by one of these animatronics causes him so much stress that he actually dies, which is insane when you look at it like that, okay? These are so scary to him that it gives him a heart attack, or just makes his heart stop working, or something. And it's 7 The Scooper. Now, I know that you may be mad and think that this is a stupid point, but hear me out, alright? The Scooper may seem like a weird but kind of normal thing, at least by FNAF standards. But w with the blueprint revealing how this thing actually works, it's incredible. It's it's such a feat of technology. It can inject whatever it ends up scooping with Remnant without really having any injection points. And its Remnant is a molten metal possessed by souls. And then, assuming my theory about Michael being a robot is wrong, it can then, by doing so, keep a person alive after removing their insides, replacing it with robot parts, and then those robotic parts leaving that body still leaves the flesh suit viable. So in essence, it just makes that person a walking case of flesh. Unless it didn't actually remove anything and instead just opened them up and then let the innards get in. But like, he flattens down like a pancake. Dude had no bones. That, that's, that's impressive, but also terrifying. That would require some serious juice. Dude's juicing. And at six, fetch. Fetch was introduced in the Fazbear Frights books and is a robotic dog made by Fazbear Inc. It, it also it gets a little a little too loving. So much so that it will actually brutally murder the girl you want to ask to homecoming. So, sorry Peter, but at least you won't have to feel bad about sending your dad to prison. Either way, a robotic dog that will kill anything you love is absolutely horrifying and should be uh, taken care of as soon as possible, if you know what I mean. Like, this, this is why you spay and neuter your animals, people. <laughs> but in all seriousness, could you imagine if this was a real thing? Like, if you, like, randomly started getting texts from a robotic dog that followed you home, that instead of bringing you dead birds or squirrels, instead brings you the bloody arm of your crush. Yeah, that sounds like something the Winchesters would fight. Or that it would be on some other really weird CW show, or some crime show or something, okay? Yeah, no thanks. Ignoring the Dean-inspired look today. <laughs> How about doing it number five, Twisted Ones? Well, the Twisted Ones certainly do seem to live up to their name. The Twisted Animatronics are these horrifically disfigured creatures that get no love from their mother like an ugly duckling. The thing is though, they don't grow into swans. Instead, they use another bit of technology that I'll get into later to disguise themselves. They also dig deep into the ground and wait until the middle of the night to crawl out and take kids who wander away from their mommies. Yeah, this legit sounds like an urban legend that parents would tell their kids to make sure that they were home before dark. I mean, I don't really know what else to say about them. Although the whole crawling into a hole and then only coming out at night thing, I wish I could do that. I, I, I don't like dirt. And it for human robots. This is something I'm sure that some people won't think is scary. Maybe they'll think it's scary good, but hey, the fact that there are robots that are actually able to look like humans is horrifying. Like, that is such a scary thing. In the original FNAF novel trilogy, it's revealed that Charlotte, the main protagonist of the books, is in fact one in a series of robots meant to allow her to grow up properly after being killed at an early age. But not only is she a robot, apparently she's also baby. At least that's what I remember reading about, okay? In the books, Charlotte's robot, or like the adult version of her robot, was also able to look like like normal circus baby thanks to the pins on her body that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's the epitome of horror. Who in their right mind would think of a concept like that? And if it was real, we would all be goners, okay? This is like the fembots from Austin Powers. That's basically what this is. And then all the down bads would be trying to give it to them and then they'd get themselves scooped. I'm surprised it didn't happen in the novels, since that one guy had his gears turning, if you know what I mean, although he, he wasn't actually a robot. Um, and if you do know what I mean, uh, can you please explain it to me? Because I'm not even, I, I understand what's going on at this point. My brain is all mush thinking about this circle of logic going on. I don't want to, no. Getting close to the end in number three, Lonely Freddy. Lonely Freddy already, in a way, kind of has a parallel in our world. I mean, like, Kinda. It's it's like the trope where someone becomes your friend and then becomes more like you and then tries to take over your life. Is that a thing? 
Is, is that actually a thing? I don't know, maybe I dreamt about it ages ago and then forgot, or maybe it was like a, a, an episode of a show. I think it might have been a show. I don't know. But like, also, just plain old identity theft is kind of another version of Lonely Freddy, uh, just not as advanced. A Lonely Freddy was introduced in the Fansbear Frights books, and it, it's basically meant to explain what psychic friend Fredbear is, maybe, or at least that's what some people assume. But it's a robot that steals your body and then traps your consciousness in to its original robot body. What the ever-loving hell? Why is that? Uh, why is that a thing? Why is that so goddamn terrifying? Especially in concept, right? But it, like, if it was actually real, what the absolute living f would I do? Okay, it's easy to say that we could just avoid them, okay? But we wouldn't know that they existed, okay? We would just be lonely kids dreaming about having friends, and then all of a sudden a robot wants to be our friend, okay? It would be vicious, and it would definitely have gotten me when I was a kid. Okay, I, I really wanted a friend, but especially a friend that was a robot. That would have been sick, man. But ultimately, in number two, reality-altering discs. I mention these every chance I get uh, because of the implications, all right? They're insane. If you don't already know, the original FNAF novel trilogy revealed that the twisted animatronics used discs that transformed how others saw them, basically creating an illusionary appearance using sound emitting from the disc that messed with your brain waves or whatever, however they explained it in the FNAF books. However, the mere existence of these discs puts everything we know about the series into question. How do we know if anything we see is real? FNAF 1 had us hallucinate different things, like it's me, along with multiple news clippings and posters, and if one of my other theories is right, even Golden Freddy himself. So like, what if that was just the discs? And if it was, what if other things were changed by the discs as well? Like, is that really what the pizzeria looked like? Do the animatronics have more of a rotten appearance than we see in the game? I don't know, and I don't like not knowing, alright? Unless it's about the creation of the universe, in which case, that is... I, I don't need to, like, see Cthulhu and die, you know? And finally, in number one, the spring locks. The spring lock mechanism is probably the most intuitive thing that FNAF's world has ever invented. The ability to move robotic parts out of the way enough for a human to fit inside a costume is nuts. And while it may be dangerous, uh, we also drive over 100 kilometers an hour in huge metal death boxes, so we can't really complain about it. And actually, you know what? Yes, we can. And while yes, cars have their faults, there is nothing compared to the ability to be both animatronic and suit, okay? That's an incredible feat of technology. Yet, it's also terrifying because of the same reasons in game. Okay, someone can dress in it and then pretend to be a robot and then clamp down on you in any second. Um, and it, as it has multiple times before, okay? It can trap you. It could, if it were real, do everything we learn about from the books and the games. Um, and it would make your life hell for fun. Especially when it can be a robot. Okay, and then the man who is like, who was once inside of it can like smile knowing that all your friends can't fight off a huge hunk of metal. You know, like superpowers, basically. Oh, also, just saying, spring locks as they're presented in the games aren't real, okay? The real life spring locks are just locks on springs. It's like your deadbolt, but on a spring. That's basically what it is. So, just don't even come at me in the comments. I know you were thinking it. Don't. And it tends Scrap Baby. Scrap Baby is a creepy animatronic. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay, Scrap Baby is by far creepier than the normal baby animatronic because, I mean, it, it, it's scrapped. So, this costume certainly does it justice. Animatronics are a difficult costume to really make, okay? I mean, it, it's understandable because, you know, we're, we're people and unfortunately don't have robotic limbs for the most part. Or if we do, we typically try and make it look like a real leg instead of a robot leg. But, uh, Scrap Baby is even more difficult because, you know, it, it's a scrap animatronic and it has a giant freaking claw. Um, so yeah, Scrap Baby is very damaged and it's a recycled version of Baby, okay? Realistic reddish, orange, light blue hair, yellow pigtails. It, it's weird, alright? It's weird, okay? She, she has an orange top with red furls and it, it, it's very damaged. Yet somehow Instagram user Gaia Spaziani was able to recreate this in an awesome way, okay? So very well done and maybe you can use it as inspiration for yourself. In at nine, Spring Trap. <laughs> oh boy. Craftix Gaming's YouTube channel features a video of a real Springtrap costume, and honestly, it's terrifying. Springtrap is the main antagonist of FNAF 3, and this costume is freaking nuts, okay? This, this is a very good costume, and while Springtrap may not be the scariest animatronic per se, uh, he's not someone that I'm gonna tussle with, you know? However, I do, I do want to talk about 
what's going on with this character because my guy, you just dressed up as a possessed man who is inhabiting an animatronic unable to die but yet still somehow decaying. I don't I don't get it. You're quite literally dressing up as a serial killer at this point. Like in in the FNAF world, if you dressed up like this, it it would be you dressed up as like Ted Bundy. It was like an equivalent in this world, okay? So, if you want to be in FNAF that badly, maybe don't dress as a serial killer is all I'm saying, okay? I know that's ironic coming from me, um, given that I wear a purple shirt on the regular, but do I look like I want to be in FNAF? No, I cry about it on the daily. I have made things very clear that I, I don't want to be in this world, and if you don't know that, go watch more videos, okay? Uh, but this, this, this is nuts, okay? That, that's insane, and if Springtrap was delivering me my pizza, I probably would cry. In a date entered. Costumes don't really have to be elaborate to be scary, okay? Take this for example. This entered cosplay by the YouTube channel Skywarped33. This entire endoskeleton, like spaghetti bits, they aren't there, but the lights and sounds make it even more frightening than you'd think, okay? The face also opens up, and I think that we all know how I feel about animatronics who can move their face at will, or at least move their face in separate sections, okay? It's not something that should be allowed. However, even without all the parts and the, the various eyes, this entered cosplay is not something that I would want to run into in a dark alley. Especially not after that goddamn vent repair minigame, because that caused me to have serious issues, okay? I used to like spaghetti, man, okay? Na now, what what do I do? I won't be ordering spaghetti from this delivery service, that's for damn sure, although if they do have entered spaghetti on the menu, I might have to. Uh, but no, 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 okay? Especially if the driver shows up wearing this, because holy crap, um, that would be terrifying, and I would rather die than see a real life entered. Um, so yeah, maybe actually don't do this. At least if you're delivering to me. And it's Seven Vanny. With Vanny being the villain uh, in the last game, and already one of the most popular characters in the entire series, I know that she's not an animatronic, okay, but chill. There are bound to be plenty of costumes of the character. However, this specific one from Rogito Ubu on Twitter is probably the most accurate and creepiest one I've seen. And yes, I said Ubu with a straight face, and let's ignore it. Vanny being being a reluctant follower does in a way technically make this also a glitch trap cosplay as well. We, we, we won't talk about it because that, that's not what counts unless you want to consider glitch trap an animatronic, in which case it's totally fine if you want to think that. This costume is probably the most realistic one on this list because, well, I mean, Vanny in the games ended up making her own suit and it's just a human inside, uh, whereas the others like Scrap Baby or Spring Trap are animatronics as well as being part human, be it soul or another body. Um, and Regina's costume costume actually follows the exact same concept. It's just a person who makes their own suit, which potentially makes this the scariest thing of all, um, but honestly, considering how she is currently the serial killer in the series, at least uh, the version that actually has like proper working limbs, I would very much appreciate not seeing a real Vanny delivering me my pizza balls. No thanks. And it's six, Buff Helpy. Okay, so this may not be like cosplay or a costume that someone could reasonably wear, but Buff Helpy is probably the most disturbing non cosplay cosplay character that I can really include on this list. If you don't already know, somehow, Buff Helpy is a meme that was created on a Daco FNAF meme review video and has ever since been haunting him and the rest of the community, okay? Don't get me wrong, I do love Helpy, but this Buff Helpy meme generated a whole load of Buff FNAF character ideas that now terrify me. Nowhere is safe from these horrific creations. If you look up any character, you're bound to find a Buff version of them at some point. It's kind of like those games where it's like, let's search up a character and see how long it takes them to be sexualized and then they scroll down. Do that with a FNAF character, but see yeah, how fast it makes them buff, okay? It's the same thing that happens to Chica, but buff, okay? No matter what this is, like what form of psychological torment this is, I would not wish it on my worst enemy. However, I'm talking about it because, you know what? It's hilarious. If Buff Helpy showed up delivering my pizza, I would constantly order from this place. Not because I want to see some like buff shirtless dude in a help mask actually handing my food but because that is the most genius marketing ploy ever and I would be very proud of them. <laughs> Halfway through in at number five, Nightmare Freddy. Nightmare Freddy is one of the most iconic versions of the Freddy character, even if there are only three games that feature them, those being FNAF 4, Ultimate Custom Night, and FNAF VR. However, this Nightmare Freddy cosplay is absolutely insane, and in my opinion, it, it would have been the front runner for the uh, Coupe de France cosplay competition, but that was back in 2017. The video was uploaded by YouTube channel Gorgon Geek, and this guy plays the robot thing very well, uh, but as soon as he drops that microphone, he goes into like terror 
mode, which is certainly something to behold, okay? I would have enjoyed it if he had the frettles with him, uh, but the moving mouth is certainly a nice touch on this costume, especially with the attempted jump scares that they do in the video, like the Ehh. Imagine if this guy got up on stage in a freaking Nightmare Freddy costume and then just started twerking. That that would have won them the gold, okay? I don't know if they won or not, but that if they if they had it, that's that's what would have gotten you the gold, okay? But also, if Nightmare Freddy was the one delivering me my pizza, I don't think that I would actually end up eating it, uh, just from just sh sheer fear that they would have poisoned it, uh, or, or maybe you put too many chili flakes on it. I mean, like, come on, look at me. In it for Nightmare. I've said it before and I will say it again. Nightmare is the scariest animatronic from these games, hands down. Get it? Because I put my hands down. This guy will get me every time, and it's one of the reasons that I refuse to play FNAF 4. The other one is, is Nightmare Fredbear, okay? But at least I don't have to really deal with them in real life, right? Oh wait, yeah, just talked about it. This is only like a nightmare character created in the mind of a coma patient in a video game, but it is still the worst thing ever. Especially thanks to Zom Bunny Creations on Amino Apps, okay? We, we've got both Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear. Ironically enough, Nightmare Fredbear is played by their twin sister. It's ironic because Elizabeth Apton is sometimes presumed to be Crying Child's twin sister. And it, anyway, these absolute hulking costumes are going to make me, let, let, let's say, drop a, a Snickers bar in my pants. If I saw this in real life, Jesus, imagine like actually like living in a house that's kind of laid out like the one from FNAF. Four, and then like your kids want to play a prank on you and then they dress in these and they come from either side for God's sakes I would actually rather die if that is what's going to happen I do not want kids my grandparents house is kind of laid out like that um, Like not exactly but it has like two sections of like on either side of the room Okay, so that could theoretically be reenacted and if that ever happens I'm going to cry so if you start delivering my pizza dressed as nightmare uh, actually good for you <laughs> In it 3, Withered Bonnie. This Withered Bonnie cosplay is probably one of the scariest FNAF cosplays I've seen and the scariest Bonnie cosplay. It is incredible that, that someone could actually do this and it comes from the YouTube user The Nick of Time. At first I legitimately thought that this was CGI instead of an actual costume, but lo and behold, it was just an insanely cool costume. Glowing eyes, seemingly actual aluminum parts, and a chest that opens that you can push out with the other hand, which results in actually quite the decent jump scare, okay? Frankly, in the video I was kind of taken aback by that, so you know what, if that's where my pizza came out of, I don't know if I would take it. This kind of thing always impresses the hell out of me because like, so far the closest I've come to making a full costume was when I helped someone work on a costume, okay? But that, that's the closest I've got and I can not even think to make something like this. So if you show up and my pizza pops out of like your abdomen ch chest area, I'm gonna tip you 100%, that's insane. But ultimately in number two, Glitch Trap. We we know my issue with Glitch Trap, alright? We know that I just want to watch William Apton burn in the deepest pits of hell and then leave me be. I want him to be in actual hell and then stay there for all of eternity so that I can move on with my life, okay? I hate this I always come back thing that he's got going on, okay? It's stupid. And despite being dressed as the purple guy on various occasions, I still want William dead. So, when I saw this frighteningly realistic looking Glitch Trap costume, uh, my nerves hit an all-time high. I think the sheer simplicity of a glitch trap suit is definitely something that makes this a hell of a creepy costume since, you know, the stitches here are very accentuated. It's very clear and made for the higher, it has higher contrast than the actual suit in the game, but either way, it's freaking creepy. And if, if the if a serial killer is going to hand me my pizza, I don't know, I was gonna say something that would make the cops concerned, and I feel like I've done that enough, so like, let's not have serial killers hand me my pizza, okay? But you know what? Good good job, Zombani Creation on Twitter, okay? But like, why? Why'd you do this to me? And finally, in a number one, Purple Guy. While Purple Guy, again, isn't an animatronic, and I guess neither is Glitch Trap or Vanny, but you know what? I had to pat out this list somehow. I think seeing some dude dressed in purple delivering me my freaking Freddy Fazbear branded pizza would actually scare me to death. Like, I don't wear purple on this channel anymore, because people kept calling me the Purple Guy, and the, the cops don't need any more ammunition against me, but also because I can't actually <laughs> find that shirt at the moment. But, but still, this is something that I would absolutely do. If I had a car, I honestly might have actually delivered food for the Freddy Fazbear's pizza delivery service if it ends up opening in Canada. And you know damn well that if I 
was doing it. I would be dressing in all purple with a security badge on my chest, maybe even like a purple phone case for the occasion just because it would be hilarious. Okay, I don't need a spring lock crank. Those aren't actually a thing in real life. While the term spring lock is used in real life, it's a totally different mechanism from what's actually in FNAF, okay? I'm certain most of you get the whole spring locks are real line from the spring locks in you how to not die remastered thread from the FNAF wiki. However, actual spring locks are just locks that use spring. Like, from my research, what I gathered was that a, a spring lock in real life is in simplest terms if your front door's deadbolt was on a spring. Every, every other instance talking about real spring locks it is just, it simply brings you to that page or it quotes that page. Um, so yeah, spring locks as they're used in the games do not exist in real life. Okay, the term is used but in the real life, it's two separate words instead of one, and they are nowhere close to the same thing. Number 10, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza from FNAF 2. While FNAF 1 features the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza that we ever saw, FNAF 2 actually features a version of the restaurant that is older than the one we saw in that first game. FNAF 2, in essence, is somewhat of a prequel to the first FNAF game. FNAF 2's Freddy Fazbear location, as such, is bigger and likely, used to be at least, more successful than the location we see in the first game. I personally want this restaurant to be real just so I can visit Balloon Boy and maybe try to pull a prank on him for a change. FNAF 2 also features a prize counter and I would be interested to see what the prizes might look like in real life. And of course would definitely be interested to wind up that music box. I don't want the puppet getting out and jump scaring anyone after all. Or do I? Do I want that? <laughs> Number 9, Fazbear's Fright. Fazbear's Fright is not technically a restaurant as food and drinks are not really served there, but it is a place where you could go if it was real that once was a restaurant. Or you know, is at least an homage to a real restaurant. So I'm gonna count it. Also because, you know, who doesn't want there to be a real Fazbear's Fright where we can all go? Fazbear's Fright is basically a haunted house style museum that was created to capitalize on the bad press and horrific mysteries that happened at Fazbear's. However, it was inspired by the restaurant, and in some stories involving the location, it even has a seemingly functional kitchen. I wish Fazbear's Fright was real because I feel like it would be the easiest way to expand on the love for this fandom without having to spend a ton of money as a company to create it. The nice thing about Fazbear's Fright is that there isn't really food made here and sold for guests, so this could just act as a really cool merch shop with some awesome props on display for fans to come see and take photos with. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, be sure to hit that like button. As you know, I'm sure there are more locations we could talk about from FNAF. I don't know about more restaurants, but definitely more places we could talk about that we wish were real. Number 8, Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental. Being a huge sister location fan, I would need to visit Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental were it to become an option. This would be an interesting location to bring to life as it isn't really about the guest experience, but would more, I suppose, be a place where you could rent animatronics, if it operated like how it does in the narrative. Aside from that, I think this would just be an interesting and creepy place to work. I think if I was reflecting on any of the locations where I could potentially get hired to work there, were it real, Circus Babies Entertainment entertainment and rental would be high up there for me on the list. What about you? If you could work at a real FNAF location or restaurant, which would you like to work at? Number 7, Fred Bear's Family Diner. This is one of the most historically meaningful locations, so of course we would want to visit it and have it be a real place. Fred Bear's Family Diner is known for being the very first in the long line of restaurants opened by Henry Emily and William Afton. At least that's what we think currently. It is likely that as the lore changes and evolves, this fact too could change and evolve because that happens a lot with FNAF. We just gotta stay flexible. And of course, considering how theories change and evolve as well, which of course is how many of us form opinions about and flush out the less established lore. As such, Fred Bear's is mainly a restaurant I wish were real so we could simply visit it and get some more clues about the story behind FNAF, whether that be in the case of actually getting to go to the real life version of Fred Bear's or just visiting, you know, a recreated replica, which is more likely because, you know, the story isn't real. The story isn't real, sorry guys. And of course the recreated replica could perhaps have clues hidden inside it in regards to more secret lore from the world of FNAF, which I would be here for. I just basically want like a FNAF scavenger hunt. I feel like that is a thing 
that I would really love. Number six, Circus Baby's Pizza World. Circus Baby's Pizza World is another location that would be really good for addressing some of the unknown lore in this world. We also don't really get a good look at Circus Baby's Pizza World during any time in the franchise this far, so this could give creators and steal wool more freedom in creating that. This would also likely help it to appeal in a different way to FNAF fans, as then we could go see something that up until this point of its physical creation has mainly just been a mysterious and unknown thing in the games. Circus Baby's Pizza World is believed to have been created in the FNAF timeline after the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location closed. It served as a temporary rebranding of the franchise or a sister location, perhaps. Although some people have theories that Circus Babies was actually supposed to be like a rival location, um, but I think it is still, even though it's not Fazbear Entertainment, it's still with that. Because you know, Afton, Afton Robotics, I believe, is Afton's company that made that. I'm sure it's all tied up. But also, you know, lore and FNAF. It's confusing. Number five, my own pizzeria? One of the coolest things about FNAF is that technically, if the restaurants from the franchise were made real, there is a chance you could get to visit your very own pizzeria. In FNAF 6, Pizzeria Simulator, we become the makers and managers of our very own Freddy's, which we can modify as we see fit and fill with animatronics, namely ones that may have snuck in via the decor you ordered from the Fazbear catalog. It would be pretty cool to go to a location where you are considered to be the owner, which is why I really want this to be a thing. Although for that to happen, either we'd have to be the ones to make the location a reality, or there would have to be a location made that has an experience sort of built in where all visitors are made to feel like the owner and manager of the location, which actually would probably be easier and of course like cooler in retrospect. Cause you know, I don't want to actually manage a place, I just want to make I just want to feel like I manage a place. It's also why I love playing games where like I get to like run restaurants in general. Number four, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza from FNAF 1. The first location of Freddy Fazbear's that we see is not actually the first location to have ever existed. This is the one, however, that I think many of us wish was real, as it remains to this day probably the most iconic location. This version of Freddy's is also smaller, which makes it feel like it would be more likely for us to see this one made in the real world. I just mean, you know, building the sister location, Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rental, or even the Mega Pizza Plex, that would be a larger investment. Whereas the Freddy Fazbear's from FNAF 1 would cost investors less, and would also cost probably less time to like put up. This Freddy's location has a main dining area with a stage a backstage, a security office, a kitchen, a supply closet, a few hallways, and of course, Pirate Cove, which seems to be out of order at the time in the first game. Although I think if we got a real Freddy's, I would prefer if this area was open and not out of order, because obviously I want to go to Pirate Cove. Like, come on. Number three, the very first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. We don't really know for certain if the Freddy's we see in FNAF 2 is the very first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. In fact, I think it's likely that it's not the first one. We know that Fredbear's Family Diner came and went, and that Freddy Fazbear's Pizza followed it, and we know that Henry, Emily, and William Afton are no longer seemingly involved with Freddy's at that time. At least they don't evidently appear to be involved. However, they could be operating behind the scenes somehow, pulling strings without, you know, anyone knowing who they really really are in regards to the company. Incognito, if you will. As such, we don't know if there were other Freddy Fazbear's locations that came in between Fredbear's Family Diner and the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza that we see in FNAF 2. After all, while there is a short period of time between the establishment of those two locations, it's possible that there were multiple locations running at once, and that perhaps they were opened up one shortly after the other. Perhaps there are more FNAF restaurants that we simply don't know about, and those ones being real would be pretty cool as they'd be completely new in regards to lore and possibly even appearance, so it would allow us to see something completely new that we haven't seen yet in the games. A fun place to explore. Number 2, Chica's Party World. Other people might not hype it, and it doesn't technically exist in the lore as far as I know, but Chica's Party World is a location that was mentioned in the source code for many of the teasers for the Sister Location game. It was teased that way, but never came up in Sister Location or anywhere else that I can think of. Still, just the idea of a restaurant where Chica is the main character sounds amazing. I mean, we all love Chica, so of course, that just makes sense as a location that, you know, we wish could be real. If it does even exist in the lore somewhere, I guess, and not just, you know, in teaser source code for SL. I also like to imagine that at Chica's Party World, instead of the food focus being on pizza, it would be on Chica's fried chicken. 
and cupcakes. I mean, there's gotta be cupcakes, right? Number one, Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Plax. I mean, obviously, I think the number one for me, and probably for all of us, has to be the Mega Pizza Plax. It's just way too cool, and it's massive. And like Gregory, I would want to be around after close. Does that seem a little crazy considering all the awful things that we witness in Security Breach as Gregory? Probably. But I still feel like it would be really cool. If not also scary, it would be just a cool place to be stuck overnight. At the Mega Pizza Plex, there is so much to see and do and explore. Just whatever you do, don't get trapped in the Phaser Blaster laser maze for a million years like Markiplier did during his playthrough. That seems like it would be more frustrating than fun. Although oddly enough, that actually has been my personal experience with laser tag in real life in the past. When I was a kid, I always got lost in those mazes. I was like, Marshall, help, where am I? How do I get out? Of here. In a 10 Halloween special. Given FNAF's track record with various expansions around Halloween, I feel like it would only make sense to have some form of Halloween special thing around these delivery restaurants. Whether it be a special menu item with a, or maybe like even a discount, FNAF has released so much Halloween DLC with FNAF 4 and FNAF VR that it would, ju it would just make sense to have something to do with Halloween with this delivery service, okay? And like I said, whether it be like a limited menu item, like maybe like some candy. Andy from FNAF VR, or as Amanda suggested to me, uh, <laughs> chocolate cockroaches, since apparently you can eat cockroaches in FNAF VR. Um, apparently it's also required to get the Let's Eat achievement, which is hilarious, but it could also just be like a random Halloween theme for the store, alright? That you can just like, like as you're scrolling through, you can see like Springtrap or the puppet watching us while we just scroll and needlessly spend our money <laughs> only to make us sit on our couches and watch more YouTube. I mean, like, if, if you're watching us, that's probably the best way to spend the inevitable end of the world, but I mean, like, Come on. And at nine, Fizzy Faz. Fizzy Faz is a set of items that can be found in Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, and uh, using them, or like obtaining them, actually increases the player's stamina, and they can be found in different locations around the map. Fizzy Faz appears to be a Fazbear Entertainment branded soda line, featuring the main animatronics of this game, and sold like exclusively at the Pizza Plex. Each member of the animatronic band is featured on the cans, and they have like a flavor that represents their like color, I think, which is kind Kind of weird, but that's a whole other thing. Okay, there's an orange flavored Fizzy Faz sponsored by Glamrock Freddy. Uh, it was located in like a control room when you when you when you first enter basement one. There's a sour lime flavored Fizzy Faz sponsored by Montgomery Gator. I mean, it, it could have been something other than lime. I feel like lime, so like gotta do the lemon and lime to actually make it work. But whatever. Pink lemonade sponsored by Glamrock Chica and a grape flavored Fizzy Faz sponsored by Roxanne. Uh, again, I feel like they're could have been better options for that because I mean like she has hardly any purple on her. She has more red so you could have done cherry but you know what that's just me. Um, but having those cans or even just that kind of branding available on the app would be pretty sick. Even if it's just like in the style of like those Funko soda cans. Uh, you know like that have the, like, the figure inside or maybe it's just like a beer cozy or something. That would be fun. And it ate themed meals. Just like how McDonald's has like the happy meals, Freddy's could have some form of themed meals as well. Whether they be based on the games or on a favorite animatronic. I think that there would definitely be some form of like pizza, like a, like a food theme that you can order, especially with the pizza. If there aren't like different combinations for the different popular animatronics, I'm gonna be mad, okay? I need to be able to order Chica's favorite pizza mashup, okay? I, I, I need the Freddy Fazbear meat lovers, or maybe the Monty Gator meat lovers, because he's a crocodile, and the crocodiles are meat. You know what I mean, okay? The Freddy Fazbear one might have like anchovies on it because like he's a bear and, and anchovies are fish. You know, I, I think it would certainly help make this place feel like more of a fast beer delivery service than just another pizza restaurant, okay? Like how Mr. Beast has like the whole like Carl's grilled cheese or like the Chandler burger on, Mr. on his his store. Yeah, this is that kind of concept, except it's just themed for animatronics instead of people. In at seven, the sun and moon drop candy. The daycare attendant is a sun and moon headed animatronic themed thing, creepy dude that is consisting of two personalities that share the same vessel in Security Breach. The character is like a mascot for two candy brands though, and they go by the names of Sunny Drop Energizing Candy and Moon Drop Sleepy Time Candy. These candies are actually how we figured out the name of the animatronic, but uh, the animatronic, like, he, he chills out in like the daycare, which is a whole other, like, 
question. Uh, but then as soon as the lights go off, uh, the moon shows up. And it's unknown if moon is activated when the lights go out in the daycare specifically, or if it's just when the area around him is dark. But however, being able to order the candy would actually be kind of cool. Uh, it would be a great addition to the app. I mean, it wouldn't really be like, it wouldn't actually be energizing or sleepy candy, because I mean, that's just caffeine and melatonin pills. But even if it's like just branded hard candy, I feel like it would be kind of a cool addition. It would in essence be a form of collector's item because of that, uh, and the amount of exclusives that this service could have uh, kind of horrifies me. Uh, um, as someone who is constantly broke, uh, the, the amount of exclusives, this is gonna, this is gonna be costly. I might, I might have to give up uh, literally my apartment for it. And it's six toys! <laughs> there are so many toys in the FNAF universe that I don't even know. I don't like I don't even need to talk about security breach in this sense. In FNAF BR, there are a ton of prize counter items, okay? In this game, prizes are unlocked at the end of levels, okay? The player will open uh, a present with a hand crank, it's kind of similar to a jack-in-the-box thing. Uh, then you'll receive a random prize or a jump scare. Uh, there are 105 separate prize items in Help Wanted, and 70 of those are not food items. Even if we went to like the action figures only, much like how McDonald's and Burger King gave out or used to give out toys. The Happy Meals, maybe like the Fast Bear Delivery Service could do the same thing, but not a Happy Meal because, you know, copyright. I, I don't quite know how it would work. Uh, they would need smaller versions of those action figures and whatnot, and I, if, I feel like it would be a lot, but it would be a little something extra for the kids who wouldn't really be satisfied having just FNAF branded food, which I mean is is understandable. Like, you, cause, like, you don't buy food, you rent it. Am I right, Fellas, just me. Okay, well, okay, I, I don't really want to keep a greasy branded pizza box around my apartment as a memory, okay? So, like, an optional toy would be a good idea. I also have no FNAF merch aside from that one shirt that I can't find anymore, so yeah. Halfway through in at number five, exotic butters. At, at, at exotic butters. Eh, 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 exotic butters. Cringy white guy aside. Despite the terrifying ships involving exotic butters with other characters, yeah, uh, sad to say I'm not exaggerating that. Uh, exotic butters x entered is a real thing. Just go watch the video. It would still be nice to have an exotic butters joke somewhere in this delivery service. Maybe a certain dish or category of food is made with quote unquote exotic butters. Or maybe they just like sell sticks of butter that are imported from somewhere else. I mean, it would be absolutely hilarious. They, they like, they could also just do a thing where like you're ordering a basket of bread or whatever, but instead send exotic butters. Uh, and like, kind of like that scene from Sister Location. Or since that would probably cause some issues with people who don't actually understand the joke, maybe just like an April Fool's Day joke thing where like every time you click on a menu item it just says you're ordering exotic butters. I don't know, they may lose business that day but it would be hilarious and I feel like Scott doesn't really care about making money so who knows. I don't quite know how it would work um, but I mean exotic butters is such a low hanging fruit at this point and I didn't actually like I didn't think about it until Amanda reminded me which is kind of sad. And for branding, I think that the appeal of this delivery service isn't going to be the food exactly okay it's going to be the fact that you're ordering from a place known as Fred Fazbear's and that's that's really the whole driving point behind this business venture that, that's what it is okay I, honestly the only reason people order for mr. Beast burger is because they like mr. Beast and or want him to notice them kind of like tier 3 subs on twitch yeah <laughs> despite it being a very very low possibility because you know it's uber eats you, you still try and before you tell me it's because you like the food that seems impossible to me I mean unless mr. Beast burger is different in the States okay I've ordered it twice and maybe got two of the some a couple of the most disappointing meals I've gotten on a delivery app okay the worst one was when the the driver put my pizza box upside down but like that's not the point my point is that if people are going to order Fazbear's it's going to be because it's Fazbear okay even if the food isn't great so driving home the branding and making it really good and iconic is going to do a lot for them in the long run especially after the novelty wears off when it first releases trust me okay I went to school for this kind of thing so I have a pretty good idea plus also have you seen this channel branding things with FNAF 
half is kind of my thing. <laughs> Alright, getting close to the end into number three, good food. However, personally, I would like to see actually good food come out of the delivery service. But I'm gonna be honest, I don't really have high hopes for it. I, I am pretty skeptical, mostly because they're just menu items that the restaurant that is doing this will also start making. And since the quality of those items is only associated with the virtual dining concept store, uh, being Fazbear uh, Delivery Service, instead of actually the restaurant that's making it, they can probably get away with slacking. Since if the quality of, let's say, your Mr. Beast Burger isn't the greatest, I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to order from Mr. Beast Burger again, despite it being the Wendy's that made it. So in my head, I'm like, yeah, I can order from Wendy's, but let's avoid Mr. Beast Burger, despite them being literally the same kitchen. Do you, you see what I'm saying? So, like, I'm hoping that these restaurants are actually end up making this, like, that make the food will be making enough from it that they actually want to have it be good quality, uh, even after the initial wave of orders, okay? I also hope that we'll have more than just, like, pizza <laughs> and, like, the same pizza that the place would make regularly, okay? For some reason, I have the idea of, like, pizza balls from the Multiverse of Madness, okay? Because, honestly, that would be unique and that would be awesome. But, like, that, aside from the pizza rolls that they initially said that they would have, okay, the one with like the unique twist and game tie-ins that we still have no idea what that means. I just, I want more unique things than just pizza rolls. You know, you, you get me? But ultimately, in at number two, inside jokes. Now, this kind of goes hand in hand with the exotic butters thing, but I'm thinking like fandom specific jokes. You know, like, yes, exotic butters, but what about the rest? Amanda suggested uh, Coffee's Coffee from Scott's other game, A Desolate Hope, and honestly, I think that that's a great idea. I mean, Coffee's character is canon in FNAF, thanks to the FNAF 3 VR Easter egg where coffee can appear on your desk, and maybe A Desolate Hope is one of the in universe Scott's other games that he made before he was being paid by Fazbear to start making fun of their tragedies. So I think that it would absolutely be possible and funny to include that as a bit of a nod to the fans. Uh, there are also plenty of other jokes that they could reference, be it in the packaging or other products. Obviously, there were the ones that we mentioned previously, pizza for the main cast of the animatronics, toys that could have some jokes as well, like maybe a buff helpy toy, which would be actually terrifying. Please don't do that. There are like, even if some of the boxes have like Toy Freddy being aggressive or something, I think that those would be a great way to help make the fans feel like they're getting a little bit of extra value out of their order because they know the series. Otherwise, like, what's the point of being invested in it if there's no jokes or, or hints to pick up on, you know? Like, kind of like a relationship, because all those have gone so well for me. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, giant flashing sarcasm sign, and like the gif from, from Big Bang Theory, you know? And finally, in a number one, secret lore! I think finally, the thing that we all want is for there to be some kind of secret lore that is going to be revealed with these restaurants. Like, maybe a secret code here and there, or maybe they end up revealing who caused the bite of 87 for real, or finally confirm that Crying Child is the one you should not have killed because no one believes me. But, no matter what way you slice it, I think that we're all hoping for and even kind of expecting some secrets to come out of these restaurants. I mean, we got it with the Fazbear Frights books, we got it with the sister location toys because, you know, you bought them all and they all made entered. We even got it with the goddamn survival log book. So, especially in lieu of this being discovered after MatPat suggested a potential FNAF ARG, I think we're all going to be surprised if this has nothing to do with that possibility. Honestly, I'm fairly certain that the only reason the Twitter account was revealed despite joining in January of 2021 was because of this leak and because people found out, okay? There were, they were certainly going to be more delayed before revealing, uh, suggesting that this was probably going to open in 2023, which also just so happens to be the time that Fazbear Fright opens in universe, the location we explore in FNAF 3, which if you thought was opening later or earlier than that, I hope that this confirms the time frame for you, but like these things aren't a coincidence. Not with Scott, not with the man who released the second FNAF game 87 days after the first, assuming that the first one would fail. No way, unless I'm crazy, which is entirely possible. And 10, Brian Wells. This is certainly an interesting case that you may not really think relates to William, but let me explain my thought process. Brian Douglas Wells was an American pizza delivery driver who was killed during a complex bank robbery plot. The plot involved a collar bomb, a scavenger hunt, the robbery itself, and a 
pizza delivery man. Following an attempt to rob PNC Bank, Wells was surrounded by police. That's when the bomb around his neck ended up detonating, killing him. And while his family denies that he was a part of it, investigators and a federal prosecutor concluded that Wells was a knowing participant in the bank robbery. However, he was told that the bomb was fake and he did not know that his co-conspirators intended for him to die. Now, I think that it was probably detonated because he got caught and they didn't want him to rat on them and that is the prevailing theory amongst these people as well, against amongst the prosecutor and whatnot. But aside from being a pizza delivery man for Mamma Mia's Pizzeria, what possible connection could he have to Afton? Well, being killed by a device that was supposed to be safe, for one, the spring locking and the collar, being betrayed by your peers, in William's case most likely Henry, and the affinity for complex plans. I feel like this may have been at least a slight source of inspiration, especially since this came up when I searched for pizza place serial killers, um, because I was hoping that there would be one. Um, uh, that's weird to say. Um, <laughs> let's just... Let's just move on. And at nine, Andrew Cunanan. Andrew Cunanan was born in San Diego, California, and eventually settled in San Francisco's Castro District and socialized with older, wealthy gay men while indulging heavily in illicit substances. It's unclear what set him off, but he began a cross-country killing spree of five unknown victims, the last of which was actually fashion designer Gianni Versace. Cunanan killed himself on a Miami boathouse in 1997, and if that didn't set off an alarm, uh, congratulations, you have not been ruined by FNAF yet. However, William Afton also had five victims at least, but definitely only had five when FNAF 1 and even around FNAF 2 was released. And while FNAF 1 does take place in 1993, many have theorized it to instead take place in 1997, which is unlikely given the minimum wage of the times and the connection to another real person, but nonetheless, it's certainly an interesting case of more possible dates lining up and the same number of victims. You know, a lot of people on this list are actually going to have five victims, and it's extremely creepy. And at 8, Nathan Dunlap. In December of 1993, after Chuck E. Cheese had closed in Aurora, Colorado, Margaret Kohlberg, who was the manager of this Chuck E. Cheese, was tallying receipts in the back room. While she was doing that, Bobby Stevens was scrubbing down the kitchen, and Ben Grant, Colleen O'Connor, and Sylvia Crawwell were all working in the main party area. However, there was someone hiding in the bathroom, 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap, who earlier that year had begun working as a cook, but was fired after an argument over his hours. But this time, he was looking for revenge. He exited the bathroom and began firing, killing everyone in the building. First Sylvia, then Ben, then Colleen, then he went into the kitchen where he shot Bobby, although Bobby ended up surviving and was actually a key witness in his case. Then Nathan went to the back room, where Margaret opened the safe before being shot twice. Nathan filled her bag with $1,500 cash, arcade tokens, and keychains, but thanks to the security cameras, he was promptly arrested and sentenced to death. Thanks to MatPat and his first game theory on FNAF, this one is fairly well known, hence why it's closer to the top, but if I didn't include it, I feel like everyone in the comments would have asked me why, so there you go. And it's seven Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were 16 serial killings committed over a period of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The two men who committed these killings, last names Burke and Hare, were doing it because they also sold the corpses to Robert Knox for dissection at his anatomy lectures. There was actually a shortage of corpses in Edinburgh, and thus people actually started grave robbing and selling the corpses rather than selling the possessions. Since a loophole in the system only considered it a theft if the body was taken with its clothes. Naked corpses were fine to take though, apparently. They didn't really think that one through. These two were killing in the name of science, something that we suspect William was doing as well. However, they actually were in a messed up way contributing to the furthering of science, whereas William is only doing it for his own selfish reasons and to become immortal. After Hare was given immunity to confess to the murders so that they could convict Burke, Burke was sentenced to death. Shortly afterwards, his corpse was dissected and his skeleton was displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2021, it actually still remains. Oh, and by the way, the reason they're known as Burke and Hare was because both of their first names are William. Yeah. So maybe Afton's wife is named something similar. And at six, Ted Bundy. During an interview with Daco, PJ Haywood, the voice actor for William Afton in Sister Location, FNAF AR, and Ultimate Custom Night, said that Scott Cawthon described William as being a charismatic, smooth-talking snake oil salesman, which coincides with Book William being able to convince anyone of anything. This is actually very similar to how Ted Bundy had been described. Bundy was regarded as charismatic and handsome, traits that he exploited to win the trust of both his victims and society as a whole. He would typically approach 
approaches victims in public places, either feigning a physical impairment such as an injury or impersonating an authority figure before bludgeoning them until they were unconscious. While he did operate nearly a decade before Afton started his spree, those are merely just like year numbers. But one of the most interesting facts, however, is that in 1975, Bundy was arrested and jailed in Utah for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. In Utah, where the games and the crimes of Afton take place. Halfway through in number five, Arthur Gary Bishop. Arthur Gary Bishop was an American serial killer in 1983, and as a result of a routine police investigation, he confessed to the murders of five young boys between 1979 and 1983. Bishop was born in Hinckley, Utah, and was the eldest of six brothers. Bishop was raised as a devout Latter day Saint, Mormon, and was an Eagle Scout and an honor student, which is already suspicious in comparison to Afton, given that Afton was also regarded as intelligent given his talent for animatronics, especially in the 80s, and his passion for business. But not only that, Bishop also operated under an alias. Bishop was arrested for embezzlement in February of 1978 and given a five year suspended sentence, but he skipped his parole and fled to Salt Lake City, living under the alias of Roger Downs. Under this alias, Bishop would then kill five boys between 1979 and 1983. It's also interesting that multiple key dates in Bishop Bishop's life line up closely to releases of FNAF games. On July 14th, 1993, he was arrested, and FNAF 4 came out on July 23rd, nine days after that. Well, not in the same year, but you know what I mean. Bishop's first kill was on October 14th, 1979, and Sister Location was released on October 7th. I mean, it's not concrete, but it's certainly interesting. Plus, also, he was caught in 1983, the same year that Crying Child was bit. In at 4, Donald Harvey. Harvey belonged to a group of psychos known as the Angels of Mercy who claimed to kill for the benefit of the victim. Harvey was convicted of 37 of his more than 57 suspected murders, and he confessed to as many as 87. When Harvey was hired at the Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital, he managed to collect over 30 pounds of cyanide which he had kept in his home. He also kept diaries and detailed notes on each one of his victims, including how he killed them. That gives me just that, that's intense William Afton vibes. Like, not not for some certain reasons, but the delusion of him thinking that he was doing it for the benefit of the victims or just for any benefit uh, is still, is, it's horrifying, okay? It's the exact same kind of delusion that I could see William having. And a similar delusion to what he seems to have in the games. In the books, he's not exactly like this from my memory, but the game version certainly seems to be the type, okay? Especially given his appearance in the Foxy Go 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 minigame where he's smiling. Getting close to the end in number three, Thomas Lee Dillon. Thomas Lee Dillon was a serial sniper found guilty of killing five men, again, with the five. Directed by voices in his head, Dillon killed people randomly. According to attending psychiatrists, Dillon's delusions of grandeur spilled over into the reality of his life and the lives of his victims. His victims were killed by a high-powered rifle while they participated in outdoor activities, sometimes hundreds of miles from Dillon's home. Authorities did not link the killings to Dillon until he actually sent a letter to a local paper. After the FBI I put together a criminal profile of the killer, a friend of Dylan's actually brought into the attention of the authorities, which in my mind is very close to the story of William Afton. The amount of victims, the authorities only investigating those murders after they got tipped off by a friend of the killer, in Afton's case that being Henry, the delusions or the voices in his head could be him being possessed. But honestly, a whole load of these people are just so much like William, it's terrifying. And ultimately, in at number two, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy, as I'm sure you know, was an American serial killer who killed 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospitals and charitable events as Pogo or Patches the Clown, personas that he had devised. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public services as a clown prior to the discovery of these crimes, but jeez. Gacy committed all of the crimes inside of his ranch house, which is a horrible idea, just like William killing inside of his own pizza. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and then dupe them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. And while this is absolutely disgusting and really makes me sick to my stomach, there are still a few similarities to Afton. Okay, killing in a place related to you, for Gacy it was his ranch house and for Afton it's his business. The target demographic is also the same with young people, although Afton also killed girls, um, which I don't, I don't even want. Ugh. And while you may think that this is a stretch, uh, even FNAF itself made the connection with FNAF AR through the clown spring trap skin. Um, intentional or not, that, come on, that's, that's a, that's a connection. 
And finally, in at number one, Robert Berdella. Robert Berdella is, to me, the seemingly perfect inspiration for William Afton. Not only did this man own his own business called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, where he reportedly sold human skulls, but he also seemingly started his killing spree in 1984. The MO is certainly not the same. Uh, Berdella would drug and kidnap men that he met in bars and on the streets, but the same idea of killing people you meet in a restaurant scene is carried over to William. There is no confirmed inspiration for William, hence this list, but there are certainly a decent amount of similarities between these two. In fact, if you combine like all the serial killers we talked about on this list, especially these last four, you'll basically get a real William Afton, and I don't like that, okay? That's horrifying. But again, that was the point of this list, so it was a way from, for me to talk about FNAF without having to talk about FNAF, okay? I didn't go into too much detail with these because, well, I, I'm sure you can guess why, um, but yeah. Either way, I think that this is a, a pretty... The, the, the similarities are scary, that's all I have to say.